everyone. Today we're going to discuss a topic close to my heart, the comics form. Now, when I use comics in this lecture, I'm referring to the art form that describes comic strips, comic books, graphic novels, and other forms and genres of comics. I prefer the term comics, though some people refer to the form as graphic narrative or sequential art. And of course, there's a variety of non-English terms describing the art form. Ones you might be familiar with, like manga, or lesser-known ones like historietas, manhua, bandesines, or fumetti, among others. In the introduction to his book, Reading Comics, Douglas Wolk writes, Comics are not prose. Comics are not movies. They are not a text-driven medium with added pictures. They're not the visual equivalent of a prose narrative or a static version of a film. They are their own thing, a medium with its own devices, its own innovators, its own cliches, its own genres and traps and liberties. So while we certainly can use tools and techniques like close reading in order to analyze comics, it's also important to remember that comics are a different form, a different medium from the text we've encountered so far this term. In today's lecture, I'm going to discuss some of the aspects of the form in order to prepare you for close reading comics. Now, to begin, just like science fiction, there's no one definition of comics. However, the most famous definition comes courtesy of Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, in which he defines comics as juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. I have a lot of issues with McCloud's definition, though the reasons are a bit too specific to get into for this lecture. However, one of the most important characteristics to take from this definition is the first part, juxtaposed pictorial and other images. So what sets comics apart from literature or visual art is that it draws on both verbal and visual signification at the same time. While plenty of people tend to think of comics as kid stuff, as a matter of fact, it makes you work twice as hard as just interpreting a text or a visual painting. You might say that you have to work three times as hard. Not only must you close read the text on its own merit and interpret the art on its own merit, you must also think about the way the text and the art interact with each other. The messages might complement each other, or contradict each other, or even complicate each other. Two messages coming together to form a new and different message. Now I've already talked a lot about interpreting text, but many of you may not be as comfortable interpreting visual art. So I'd like to take some time by discussing the components of visual art. Images create meanings in a variety of ways. This is called visual rhetoric. Visual rhetoric can be boiled down to six characteristics, starting with size. The relative size of objects is an important way artists draw our eyes to certain details. We tend to pay more attention to big objects. That doesn't mean the small details are any less important. We also associate certain sensations with big and small. Big is loud, while small is quiet, for example. This page is from the Clamp manga Clover. Notice the way you look at the large black wing first, even though there's a tiny inset image in the top of the page. Because the panel of the foot touching down is very small compared to the rest of the page, it seems more quiet, almost gentle, and easy to overlook. After size comes color. Colors produce really visceral responses in us. We associate emotions very strongly with certain colors. Blue and sadness, yellow and happiness, red and anger. Artists can use these associations with emotions and concepts to trigger certain responses in their audience. Take, for example, this page from Alan Moore and Brian Boland's The Killing Joke. Even though it is a serious comic, the Madhouse color scheme creates a sense of insanity and chaos. If you're not convinced that color can affect your response to an image, check out this recent recoloring of The Killing Joke. The color palette uses less saturated colors and warmer tones than the original. It looks more realistic and serious, but it loses all of the carnivalesque feeling of the original. After color is line. Are the lines an artist uses scratchy or smooth? Are they straight or wobbly? Is the weight or thickness of the line even, or does it become heavier and lighter? Are the lines legible or messy? These can really affect the look of a piece of art. For example, the Belgian artist Hergé pioneered a style called Lien Claire, in which he drew all of his lines with the same thickness. The result is a very easy to read page and a somewhat cartoony look. After line is texture. Because most visual art is two-dimensional, artists have to use tricks to give their art a sense of texture. If a drawing looks rough or smooth, bumpy or flat, soft or hard, an artist has successfully manipulated the component of texture. Next is value. Now value refers to the relative darkness and lightness of color. 
Another word you might use is shading. When an artist manipulates value, they create a sense of depth. These diagrams demonstrate the ways artists can use value to create certain effects. The final component is composition. Composition refers to the way objects and elements in a picture are arranged on the page, canvas, or surface. Artists use composition to direct a viewer's eyes across the page in certain ways. Let's return to that earlier page from Clover. When we discuss size, I mentioned that we tend to see the black wing first because it is much bigger than anything else on the page. Its value is also much deeper than the white on the rest of the page. This composition, however, is also very effective at drawing our eyes. We look at the black wings first, and because the feathers slowly point upwards, our eyes are drawn up to the smaller inset panel. Then, the negative space between the wings at the bottom of the panel is almost an arrow pulling our attention down. Finally, the swoop of the white wings pulls our eyes down to the girl in the center. Composition is particularly important to comics because not only does each individual panel have its own internal composition, but the page as a whole also has a composition. Now, I realize I'm using some terms that some of you might not know if you're not familiar with comics. So now that we've talked about the basics of visual rhetoric, I'll explain a few terms specific to the form of comics. We'll start with the page. This is a page from a short Hellboy comic strip by Mike Mignola. The page might seem obvious, but it's an important part of the comic that often gets overlooked. As I mentioned earlier, each page has its own composition, just as each panel has its own composition. A panel is an individual unit of the comic page. Panels are traditionally square, but artists often experiment with the shape. Many panels come together to make a page and tell a story. Now, believe it or not, the space between panels is super important to comics. We call it the gutter. Why is this blank space important? Well, comics aren't like film. They aren't constantly moving. As a result, we have to fill in the blanks as to what happens between panels. The gutter is our space for interpretation. And Scott McCloud calls this procedure closure. Without our brains filling in the blanks between panels, a comics page is just a strange collection of images next to each other on a page. Sometimes what happens between panels is really obvious, like when two people are having a conversation. But sometimes there's a lot left up to the reader. McCloud uses this example. What happened between these panels? Did the man with the axe kill the other man? Or did the other manage to avoid the axe but still scream from fear? Or is the scream someone else's? Maybe someone's watching a horror movie and no one's actually dying. What happens in that space is entirely up to you, though you will likely use context from the nearby panels to develop a reasonable interpretation. Back to our comics terms. Some of you probably know, but it's worth making sure we're all on the same page. We refer to these as speech balloons or word balloons, sometimes as word or speech bubble. This example is the standard shape, though sometimes artists play with the shape of the bubble to indicate if a person is yelling or crying, for example. While word balloons show what a character is saying or thinking, captions are slightly different. They're usually, but not always, rectangular as opposed to rounded. Captions are descriptions and information not said by the character. Oftentimes, captions are the voice of the narrator. Finally, sound effects. Sound effects take a lot of different shapes, but are always language indicating some sort of non-speech sound. You know, bang and pow. In this case, oop. Now, there's obviously a whole lot more that can be said about comics and visual rhetoric, but I have a feeling some of you are probably already a little overwhelmed. Just like close reading a text, reading comics and interpreting visual art takes practice. Don't be discouraged if you don't get it right away. Now, the first comics text we'll be reading is a short story by Japanese artist Moto Hagio. Manga, or Japanese comics, are read in a different direction than Western comics, from right to left instead of from left to right. Be sure to read the note at the top of the PDF. See you next time.